Right, greetings to the second half of this philosophy club um, on the 3rd of December, St. Lucius's Day, good King Lucius. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to do next, we're going to look at number 51, which is Lutheran Christianity. Um, I have to say I have mixed feelings about Luther, um, who was a great Protestant reformer. He began his life as a Christian Catholic, a monk in Germany. Um, he became a theologian. He was educated quite highly. I mean, he had, you know, qualifications to teach in the university. But, and he had one brilliant idea, which was he read the Bible fully. He read particularly the letters of Paul. He read Romans. He poured over it. And he was a very deeply introspective kind of guy. So he thought a lot. And then one time in particular, near Halle, he was caught out in a thunderstorm. And it nearly killed him, and he made a vow to take God really seriously. He, he, you know, he was quite a serious, devout person. And he felt what we owe to God is, is sort of our absolute sincerity and absolute truth. Now, all that I can admire. You know, I would have loved to have met Luther and pat him on the back and say, you're right there. And his core idea was that, and he got this from rereading St. Paul mainly, that... Without faith, knowledge is meaningless. If you don't have any actual spiritual faith in any of this stuff, it's just like um, reading bus tickets or reading a menu. I mean, it, it's, it has no meaning. Whereas if you, in order to qualify as a proper Christian, whatever your label is going to be, whichever box you're going to sit in, you have to have some living faith in, in, in the core message. Okay, well that, that's obvious, I would have said. I would have said to Luther, if he'd have presented me that in a doctoral thesis, I would have said, well done, Mr. Luther, that's great, B minus. You know, like, that's just obvious. But unfortunately, what happens with these academic types is that they get one idea and then they can't, there's no room in them for any other ideas. That becomes the sole idea. Now, Luther was a member of the Augustinian order, um, and the head of the Augustinian order was a man of much greater intellectual subtlety called Cardinal Egidio, who was based in Rome but travelled about. And he was a real theologian who, um, I've said this before possibly on another occasion, but he studied the Kabbalah and he had various rabbis working in his house in Rome translating the esoteric Kabbalistic scripts from Hebrew into Latin. Egidio realised that the Gospels, Christ's teachings, don't really make much sense unless you understand the esoteric Hebrew teachings of the Kabbalah, which are about deconstructing the literalist view of the Old Testament and reconfiguring it as an esoteric eternal text in primordial wisdom. Now that's what Egidio was trying to do. And I've got a plan to write the play of when Luther came to Rome he must have met a Judeo. They must have had coffee. Uh, not coffee, they didn't have coffee, but they must have had herbal tea together or a glass of wine or something. And Luther would have said, it's faith alone. And a Judeo would have just smiled at him and said, yes, thank you so much for that insight. Yes, yes. <laughs> but have you thought of these 240 other insights that other thinkers have come up with? I mean, we already had on the table by then the work of... Um, Pico della Mirandola, another great Catholic thinker and intellectual, who'd written 900 theses. You know, most people do a doctoral degree, a thesis, one thing, right, like Luther. Pico did 900 in this text, which integrated the Kabbalah with Christian universalism and philosophic Christianity. Both Egidio and, and Pico were what I call Christian philosophers. Now, Luther wasn't of their calibre, I'm sorry to say, I mean, what, what they should have done is, is, is ed help to educate Luther to, to a higher perspective. Like, what do you mean by faith? Break it down. Look at it in Hebrew. Look at it in, um, you know, look at it in the Quranic context, in, in other religions. What about in <coughs> ancient Rome? I mean, P Pietas, what did faith mean to the average Roman? So all that would have kept Luther's mind busy as a professor. But instead, <clears throat> he just kind of bashed on about this insight. 
And unfortunately, it had negative consequences because what Luther, by going on about faith, the, the message got distorted with Chinese whispers so that his, the peasants who heard Luther talking and heard about his writings and so on took it to mean that only faith matters and therefore nothing else matters. They took it a logical a couple of missteps um, and therefore all the churches, all the artwork, the sculptures, the books, they can all go on the bonfire. Because I've got faith, and I don't care about all that. Now, that is, that is an inversion of authentic faith, in my opinion, or authentic insight. It's, it's a kind of, it's, <clears throat> it's this distortion. I mean, in the dialectical laws of, of Marxism, it always says, this was an insight of Engels, who was a Lutheran, by the way, um, that things turn into their opposites over time. This is a quirk about history. Things turn into their opposites. So what begins as a progressive revolutionary force for liberty, equality, and fraternity deteriorates and becomes a tyranny in which some despot is ruling you like Stalin or Mao. Well, <clears throat> the same with this idea of faith is an entranceway to the kingdom of God. It was then misinterpreted to mean that that's the only entranceway and all the others are invalid and if you want to walk down those ones, we're going to get you. Okay, so that, that's the problem of what happened to Lutheranism, is it became a sort of dogmatic self-trumpeting of the faithful as opposed to everyone else, which leads to a sort of spiritual inflation. It's like, well, I have faith, you don't, you're going to hell. You know, I mean, unless you're willing to do blah, 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 and show me you have faith. Get down on your knees right now and say you have faith in the living, risen Jesus. Otherwise, you're going to hell. Now, this is the basis of all these so-called evangelical teachers that parade on American television and rake in lots of money. It's like, it becomes like a sort of cult for, for um, raking in cash so that, you know, unless you can declare your faith in this, in this demonstrative way, um, you're a heretic and you're going to go to hell. Now that's a, that's a fright, it's a sort of spiritual terrorism, actually. That's a horrible thing. And if I started walking around the streets of Batet shouting at everyone, unless they get down on their knees and declare faith in the living Jesus, like Luther, they're going to hell. I mean, they'd look at me quizzically, quite rightly, <laughs> because they're mostly good Catholics around here, and they, they sort of understand philosophy a bit. Um, but I'm for, so anyway, Luther, yes. I think about a B- minus for the thought C minus or D minus for the effects. Because then it led to this Protestant <clears throat> um, triumphalism, which became very anti Catholic and saw it as its mission to kind of, um, you know, um, <clears throat> destroy a lot of what Catholic Europe had achieved. Um, so, but I don't think the intention was that from the outset. And I think. I just think Luther was mis misadvised, miseducated, um, and and not fully qualified. He was in he was in too deep in in muddy waters that he didn't fully understand. It's interesting that Henry VIII, although there are many things about him I don't agree with, he didn't like Luther either. Um, you know, again, I'd love to find his private diaries as to had he worked this out. What I'm what I'm trying to explain here, um, possibly. Um, but anyway, you know, Lutheranism is, has been very influential. It became the dominant religion of northern Germany, Berlin. They all became Lutheran, um, you know, peoples. The South remained Catholic in Bavaria, but Lutheran um, faith became dominant, and not just in Germany, but also in Scandinavia, in Sweden, in Denmark, in Norway. Uh, lots of Lutherans went to the Americas, and there's a big Lutheran church in, in Canada and the USA. Um, <clears throat> and also in England, there's a you know, significant Lutheran presence. Um, it were, and, and many of them have been deep, amazing contributors to Christian ecumenical thought. Um, um, you know, and, and great theologians. Uh, one of them helped found the Fellowship of Reconciliation with an Anglican. On the outbreak of World War One, 
these two men who were studying at Cambridge, one an Anglican, one a Lutheran, shook hands and said, this is outrageous, we shouldn't be going to war with each other, you know. We, we declare eternal peace. And they founded this Fellowship of Reconciliation that's still going today, I've been a member of it. And Muriel Nestor, who was a friend of Gandhi, was, was a sponsor of it. It's still going. Um, you know, and, and <clears throat> I think some, some, some Lutheran theologians would understand what I'm talking about, the limitations of Luther's original insights, but that's not a problem because they've added to them since. <clears throat> some of the greatest German philosophers, like Kant, was a Lutheran, who, who was a profound thinker. There was a movement in Lutheranism called Pietism, which Kant came from, which said that it kind of like it was an application of Luther's insight, but at a higher level. It said that God's mysteries are so profound that even though we stretch our intellect to the fullest potential, we'll never be able to work them out because God is God and we're human. At some point, we have to therefore take a leap of faith. We can't actually prove the existence of God, right? Like, logically, rationally, so that everyone will get it. People have tried, Anselm tried, you know, Aquinas tried, there's various attempts. Um, the only thing that can prove it is actually a spiritual leap of faith into the into the mysteries like dive there's a difference between sort of measuring the diving board measuring the height from the diving board to the water and like planning the trajectory you can do all that mathematically but it's different if you actually dive in and that's what Kant was essentially saying um, another great Lutheran theologian is Schelling who again took some of the core ideas of Luther but expanded them way way beyond him and he was a very profound thinker who became professor in uh, Germany and Hegel who's one of the greatest theologians I think of the 19th century was a Lutheran so he has his own box Hegelian philosophy as does Kant you know so, so they, it's not that they've not tried <laughs> these Lutheran thinkers they've been incredibly busy trying to make up for the, the problematic insights of, of maybe Luther himself one of the other problems about Luther and Lutheranism was a certain anti-Semitism in Luther's thinking. Because he didn't understand Judaism, he, he never read any Hebrew, he never studied the Kabbalah, he knew nothing about esoteric Judaism. He had this sort of bias against Jews. He felt they're all weird, odd. They shouldn't be allowed to do what they're doing, dressing funny and wearing long hair and they've got funny cloaks and you know, whatever. He, he didn't get them, right? And, <coughs> and this streak of what later, much, much later, was called anti-Semitism was there in the Lutheran form of Christianity. In a way that's unacceptable, I think, to, to, to me as an intellectual, because I've studied and I've known Jewish thinkers at a very high level, and they're amazing. The philosophy that I think is worth having, which I think what Christ would have wanted, is one that includes all the varieties of Christians, all the varieties of Jews, all the varieties of Muslims, in one great harmony. And, you know, I'm reading at the moment a book by King Charles III, who's I've met, and who's a great intellectual in his own right, called um, Harmony. And, you know, I think this is Charles's position. Um, whereas Luther's was, was more like finding distinctions, divisions. No, the Jews weren't going to be allowed into heaven because they were Jews and they killed Christ and they were the bad people. Well, you know, this is, this is a, a medieval peasant's worldview. And the trouble with Luther is that deep down he remained a medieval peasant. He also believed literally in heaven and hell. He, he believed in devils literally. And so <coughs> these, are, these are medieval worldviews that... that rational Anglican theologians grew out of about, you know, at the time of Herbert of Cherbury, about 1600. So, um, but anyway, it took a while, and, the, you know, they eventually got there, most of them, Hegel and co. Um, <clears throat> then we have Swedish archbishops um, who helped set up the ecumenical movement, um, a very great, you know, 
succession of Swedish Lutherans who've done enormous work for advancing interfaith harmony and ecumenical harmony, founded the World Congress of Faiths. Um, I've been blessed when I was an interfaith peace activist with the World's Conference on Religion and Peace. I went to a conference in, in Gotland in, in Sweden and we went and had dinner in the Archbishop's Palace, the Lutheran Palace, like something out of a movie, uh, very dark wood furniture, the palace, um, you know, it was his Episcopal Palace. Um, and there were priests milling about with their dark clothes and, and we had some interesting theological discussions um, for peace. So, you know, they're, they're doing great work now. Um, just a pity about the, the Thirty Years' War and the mass slaughters of, you know, all sides. I mean, as a philosopher for peace, coordinator of philosophers for peace in Europe, if I'd been around then, I would have tried to stop that bloodbath and I would have insisted that you know, the, the leading thinkers have got together and worked out a peace deal. Um, and still, it's, it's, it's long overdue. I mean, we still don't have an official peace treaty between all the Catholics and all the Protestants. But that's why I wrote my Interfaith Peace Treaty, which is to provide the text of it. Um, <clears throat> but my Interfaith Peace Treaty is ecumenical. It includes Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, etc. Okay, so that's the Lutherans, bless them. Um, I will say the only time I've ever seen the full works of Luther is in the library of the former Prime Minister Gladstone, a great liberal thinker in Wales, where I ran a seminar on the educational implications of 9-11 in 2001, in November that year after that tragic event had happened. So I hired um, St. Daniel's Library for the weekend and we had a fantastic conference with speakers and stuff and in my spare time I, I used to pop into the library and there was collected works of Luther on the shelves. So Gladstone knew about Luther and had read him. Um, <clears throat> I don't know anyone who's ever read the complete works of, of Luther otherwise. Um, <clears throat> okay, next one. Let's do number 55. 55 is humanism, Christian humanism about 50 million today, in history about 500 million. Um, humanism is a very interesting kind of tradition in, in, in Christianity. Um, it sits alongside philosophical Christianity, but it's slightly different emphasis. Um, it began as a term in the early Renaissance period, in the 1300s in Italy, and it denoted a certain type of scholar that was interested in the original classical sources of knowledge. So a humanist would, would learn ancient Greek, would learn original Latin, and would go back and look at the original texts. They were just getting texts from the libraries, um, recovering the works of Plato and Aristotle and all the great poets like Virgil. And a humanist would want to study them all and read them all in the originals and in translations, and, and would feel that by going back to the source, we can, we can find the origins of our culture and civilization as Europeans, as human beings. And the value of studying these ancient works is not to sort of, you know, just get lost in, in dark alleys of, of knowing that's useless to anybody, no, it's to find the living meaning at the heart of that classical civilization, Greece and Rome, that, that gave birth to philosophy. As we've seen in our class, you know, the Orphic schools, the Pythagorean, the Platonic, the Aristotelian. I mean, this is the heart of European thought and civilization. So humanists wanted to find all that stuff and reopen the minds. It's like the minds had been shut for a thousand years during the Dark Ages, when knowledge of this stuff had been lost. The humanists were the people that went down with their picks and uh, shovels and reopened the mines to get the gold out. And they did it the hard way. They learned Latin. They learned Greek. They read Virgil in the original. They read Homer. And in the case of Erasmus, who was a great humanist, they read, they read the New Testament in the original Greek. They said, we can't understand Christ unless we resituate him in the classical context from which he came. So let's look at the Greek text. Let's, let's try and fully understand what was being said there. So the humanist tradition is a classical scholarly tradition that appreciates and, and 
values that classical heritage of European thought. And it says it's not antithetical to Christianity because these guys were wise, you know, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Homer, uh, Virgil, <coughs> Varro, you know, C Cicero and so on. These are the core texts that you must study. They were seriously wise people. I mean, I've just discovered something very interesting. That there were two Pythagorean thinkers in Rome um, at the time of Caesar. Uh, there were a whole bunch of these really interesting classical thinkers who looked back to Pythagoras. One of them was called Nigidius Figulus. You know, he doesn't, he's not often taught about. He was a seriously interesting Pythagorean philosopher who happened to be a personal friend of Caesar. And he took Caesar's side in the civil war between Caesar and Pompey, uh, which split Roman society. Um, other Pythagoreans took Pompey's side. So you have this, you know, like this, this battle of Pythagoreans splitting the Roman Republic. Um, if I'd have been around, I would have got them all together in Rome and said, work out a peace deal. No more Romans should die. And I think that would have been the position of Pythagoras as well, because he was a peace thinker. But the point I'm making here is that the more we find out about the classical sources of thought <coughs> and literature and European civilization, the more we see it can be harmonized with Christian teachings. If you read the Gospels properly, you know, and, and as a scholar, which is what we should be doing, and that's what the humanists said, don't just read it with faith, read it with intellect, read it with geography, read it with history, read it with knowledge of the languages, read it by situating it in its historical context. You know, um, later they would soon come to say, read it with some knowledge of archaeology, because the humans also, in a sense, invented archaeology by digging through the ruins of ancient Rome and, and realising what treasures were under their feet, you know. So when you do that <clears throat> and read it as a proper humanist, you can understand what Christ was actually saying in the context of his day. And you can see that, well, there were lots of, you know, Pythagoreans and wandering Orphics and Dionysian artificers and all kinds of Magi and Druids and sorcerers saying similar stuff. Christ was just one of a whole genre of thinkers. Um, and I have a book here which sort of, you know, labours that point called Jesus the Sorcerer by Robert Connor, which is a classic book, you know, which explains how Jesus was a May guy in the traditional sense of being a magician doing white magic, effectively. Um, and, and, you know, he speculates, well, what does that mean? What, what is white magic? What was he doing? Well, the only way we're going to find out is by studying all the source texts in Greek and Latin, because the world was full of that stuff. Um, <clears throat> another example of, of a humanist um, mission would be understanding the Delphic Games, which was lost to history. For a thousand years, the Delphic Games were as important as the Olympic Games. It was <clears throat> where the artists, the theatre performers, the musicians, the dancers came together to Delphi, under Apollo and Dionysus to celebrate the arts. Through that, they advanced peace. Had Christ ever heard of the Delphic Games? They were going on at his time. I think it's possible. You see, I think Christ was not a stupid man. He was, he was not a sort of fanatical Lutheran type going around saying, believe in me or you'll be damned. He was, I think, a learned man, educated partly in Alexandria, partly possibly further east, um, who'd, who'd absorbed the inner teachings of Kabbalah, who'd lived it, who dived, as Kant said, into the lake of experience, which is why he goes off in the desert and does his 40 days retreats and things, who was not arrogant, he was humble, he went and studied with, we know John the Baptist and other wandering teachers. And, <clears throat> and therefore I think he, yes, he would have heard of, you know, the Delphic Games, for instance, which was the great place to be if you were any kind of an artist or cultural figure or public speaker or anything. Um, and there's many hints in his, in his, in the Gnostic texts and in the inner Gospels, if you read them properly, about that wider perspective that I think Christ had. Anyway, that's all.
what I'm saying here is just classic humanist stuff. This is what a humanist position is. That and I, I was fortunate to be born, my mother was a Latin teacher. She taught me this stuff when I was young. When I was a little boy, she made me read the Greek myths and Roman myths. And that, that's the way to become a humanist. You have to understand Apollo and the muses and, and how the gods create the world. You know, it's, it's the humanists reclaim those myths and said, I'm still a Christian. I'm, I'm happy to go with Jesus as my number one teacher, you know, top rabbi, but I also belong to this wider civilization called European culture, and I'm also therefore claiming my birthright to understand all that. I, I think Greek and Latin should still be taught in every, to every schoolboy and girl in Europe. In Britain, it's only the elites at Eton and places that get taught it nowadays, which is, I think, to the impoverishment of us all. Um, anyway, that's, that's Christian humanism. <clears throat> and, you know, it's deep stuff. Um, okay, I'll do one more, and then, then we'll stop. Um, the, the last... Um, uh, the last box I want to do is, let's have a look. <clears throat> so that was, okay, the last box I want to do is number 46, which is the Quakers, um, as they're called, or the Society of Friends. Again, it means a lot to me because I'm personally also a Quaker. Um, I discovered them... Growing up in Brighton, my parents were peace activists. They were, they were always Quakers coming around for tea. They were the hardcore of the peace movement who weren't Marxists. You were either communist or, or a Quaker if you were a hardcore peace activist back in the 60s. And I learned to respect them. And there's a lovely centre in the middle of Brighton called Friends Centre where they used to do something mysterious I didn't fully understand. But they had things like art classes and dance and stuff. And every Sunday, although as a family we didn't go, I did later when I moved to Canada and became a sort of free person, got away from Britain, and then I looked back on its culture and realised the Quakers were actually quite special. They were founded in Britain by a man called George Fox in the 1600s, during the Civil War times. He was in the Parliamentary Army, but his heart wasn't in it. He didn't really like being a soldier. He believed that as Christians we should be living in fraternity and harmony not worrying about the name, whether you call yourself a Protestant, a Catholic, or whatever. Um, and the core thing was this witness to peace. So the Quakers grew and evolved into a pacifist church. They refused to fight. They wouldn't join the army. Um, he took literally Christ's saying against Peter using the sword to fight off the kind of people that came to arrest Christ. Christ said, no, no, you know, those that live by the sword die by the sword. And so Fox became very, very brave. He went around the Midlands in England and all over England preaching this, this kind of new idea that Christ was a peace teacher and that we should stop fighting. And that annoyed some of the authorities. Sad to say, some of the Anglicans who were the established church, they kept locking him up in prison as a dangerous dissident. You know, if this teaching of peace got out, what would happen to the British army kind of thing? You know, and Britain was just becoming an imperial power, so it was a threat to that. Well, <coughs> tough. You know, I think Fox was right. I think that Christ's real message was peace between peoples, between genders, between religions, and between man and God. And you can't fight your way to that. So Fox was very strict in his non non well non-violence as it came to be called. Um, many great Quakers have come since then. Um, at the time of King James II, uh, William Penn became friends with the king and the king granted him Pennsylvania as a state to go off and people it with Quakers. And it became the haven of, of America. It was the sort of heartland of American radicals and still today there's you know, universities and, and schools run by Quakers in Pennsylvania um, who borne witness to peace. Um, they were active in supporting the civil rights movement of Martin Luther King. The Quakers have taken a stand against racism and against slavery in American history. 
and they helped get slavery abolished in Britain. The first country actually in the modern world to abolish slavery was Britain, and that was largely through the Quakers, um, and some Anglicans helped, and other dissenters. So, <clears throat> in in you know the um, 19th century, they tried their best to stop the American Civil War. Again, they bore witness. During the American Revolution, they, they tried to stop the violence in the American Revolution. Trouble is, being a person of nonviolence in America is a bit like being a snowball in hell, because America is full of, like, can you imagine <laughs> trying to stop the American Civil War? And then they tried to stop World War I and World War II and the Cold War and the Vietnam War and the Korean War. I mean, the Quakers had been up there saying, stop fighting throughout and I admire them and that's why I started going to Quaker meetings in Calgary in Canada in the 80s and um, Quakers come together once a week they sit in silence for an hour and they go into an interior meditation so like, they're like the Sufis of Christianity they don't do ritual singing and uh, the communion mass and all that stuff um, they, they've pared Christianity down to the core, which is silent communion with the divine. And I do that every day, I'm a, I'm a, but I don't do it for a whole hour. I have a daily practice that I've done for the last 20 years or so um, of meditation. Now, is it Buddhist? Is it Quaker? Is it Druid? I don't think, I don't think the labels matter. Silence is silence. And that's what I learned from the Quakers and why I respect them. Um, they helped me when I created my Peace Institute at the University of London. Quakers funded my initial research into that. So I have a long history of involvement with the Quakers. There aren't enough of us, unfortunately. Um, one would wish there would be a few more to stop things like the beatings going on in, in Iran and Afghanistan or um, you know, the wars going on in, in Russia and Ukraine. Um, <clears throat> Quakers have, have tried to talk to power. One, one of the, I think it was George Fox said that the definition of a Christian is someone that will talk truth to power. We've carried on trying to do that. I mean, I have a personal correspondence of letters to the rich and powerful going back 30 years. You know, It doesn't seem to do much good. <laughs> That's the problem. So, so I'm not sure only Quakerism is enough. That's why I also was baptised in Anglican. That's my backup position. Right? The Quakers are lovely, but in a fight, you know, sometimes it comes to a, to a fight, they're not much use. They kind of melt into the background and say, oh, well, both and. Sometimes things are, you do maybe, I mean, I put possibly, you have to take a stand on things. Um, but anyway, you know, hats off to them. A very profound lineage of, of Christian Sufis, um, <clears throat> so to speak. Not so good on scholarship. One of their great thinkers was Rufus Jones, who was a great Quaker historian, professor. One of my slight problems with George Fox is that he was rather scathing of scholarship. Um, he, he wasn't a highly educated man himself. Um, his scathing remark against humanism was, well, what's the point of Latin and Greek? Christ was crucified on a cross with words in Latin and Greek on the top, so that didn't do much good for him. You know, I mean, come on, George, that's a bit silly. I don't think George Fox, who was from a sort of lower middle class tradesman background with very little education, understood the importance of scholarship and the kind of research work that humanism does. He didn't understand the intellectual's job. Um, that's not to criticise him, it's just a statement of fact, you know. And, and the fact is I can't help being an intellectual, so, so that's kind of why in a sense I, I feel the Quakers need, need a sort of um, an adjunct of, of another level of discourse into their, into their silence, because sometimes one has to speak up. Um, I've actually applied for a professorship at a Quaker University in Pennsylvania, uh, so that would be fun if I get that job. I will 